ಹೇಳಿದ್ದೇನೆ Hello everyone, uh, I, would like, I would like to welcome you in our symposium. Uh, it is a voice for over for you, Professor Fukami, uh, over for you to, to talk. Hello everyone, uh, I am now Fukami, the director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science in uh, the research station in Taiwan. Uh, thanks to, to join uh, our the, the webinar lectures. And at the first, I read on behalf of the president of JSPS, Professor Susumu Satomi. He was the director of Tohoku University Hospital from 2004 and the president of Tohoku University from 2012. After he became the president of JSPS on 2018, for this webinar about COVID-19, he is the best person of the opening speaker, though he could not join uh, in his busy schedule. I am very sorry. So, uh, a, mo a moment, please. Mm. I am very pleased that this milestone symposium can be held under the joint sponsorship of uh, JSPS and the Egypt National Research Center with the cooperation of the JSPS Alumni Association of Egypt. At the opening of this symposium, I would like to extend our appreciation to all of the many supporters. I would also like to uh, extend a word of thanks to invited lecturers. As you may know, JSPS is Japan's core research funding agency, established in 1932 for the purpose of prom promoting science as part of its mission to build strong networks for advancing international joint research. JSPS Mm, uh, has established 10 overseas offices in nine countries around the world. These offices serve as Japan's science embassies in the host countries and regions. As such, uh, they promote and facilitate scientific exchange, uh, disseminate 
information on scientific activities and developments on Instagram, support uh, Japanese researchers uh, laboring abroad, and coordinate with JSPS alumni associations among various other functions. Among our uh, overseas offices, the JSPS Kai Research Station is one of with the longest history. The present center was established back in 1984. It serves as JSPS core hub in the North Africa and Middle East regions. Beginning with Egypt, the Kai office serves serve the country by sustaining change uh, between them and Japan. The office employs a of activities in carrying out this mission. We at the uh, JSPS will continue to work through our Cairo research station to sustain and develop a cooperation with the related institutions in ways that further contribute to mutual advancement of scientific exchange. I have heard uh, that the researchers from various countries, including Egypt, India, Japan, Morocco, Brazil, and the United Kingdom, will deliver lectures on the topic of COVID-19 from their own perspectives to solve the current crisis. Each of us should remain extra cautious about the present COVID-19 threat posed on the global scale. Beyond that, knowledge sharing and collaboration between healthcare professionals and researchers are essential. I believe that this symposium will contribute to such efforts and provide all of you a very fruitful experience. Uh, Japan has overcome the enormous damage from the major earthquake on March 11, 2011, which was followed by the tsunami and the nuclear accident. Ever since, it has continuously fighting against the natural disaster such as torrential rain disasters and earthquakes that occur every year across the country. I hope that COVID-19 pandemic will also be beaten in the foresee uh, foreseeable future. Lastly, I wish to extend a word of thanks uh, to Dr. Naoko Fukami, director of the JSPS Kai Research Station and her staff for the great effort they put into pre preparing this symposium, uh, looking forward to flourishing of scientific exchanges between Egypt and Japan. I extend heartfelt wishes for health and safety all attendees. Uh, at trust, I want to add our feeling of gratitude to many lectures all over the world, amongst them to Professor Dr. Mohamed Hashim, President of National Research Center, who accepted to collaborate the collaboration willingly. And I want to appreciate the effort of Dr. Wara Saad. She planned, the, planned this wonderful opportunity where many scientists think about COVID-19 together with the support of Professor Ibrahim Tantawi, the president of our alumni, and the Professor Gad El Kadi, the president of Nariyaj, and also our alumni board member. Uh, thanks for your listening, and I wish the series of webinar lectures would bring about a fruitful and meaningful approach and outcome to our new generation living with corona. And the but, and we believe someday in your future when we might overcome COVID-19. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fokami. So uh, I, would I would like to welcome Mrs. Kami Yemen, Japan Embassy, the, uh, the uh, talk for you now. Hello. Hello. Did you hear? 
Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Professor Dr. Muhammad Qasim, President of National Research Center. Uh, Dr. Fukami, Director of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science in Cairo. Professor. Uh, unmute your mic. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. So uh, I was mentioning the people that the you taking a seminar. So uh, again, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hassan, Dr. Kami, and Professor Dr. Al-Ekhadi, President of National Research Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And also Professor Dr. Ibrahim Kantali, uh, President of the SPS Alumni Association in Egypt. Dr. Warasad Hanafi, ANRC. Distinguished professors, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, good afternoon. My name is Kamiyama, Director of Information and Culture Center, Embassy of Japan in Egypt. First of all, um, let me express my sincere gratitude to the population of all the stakeholders who provide a valuable opportunity to discuss a very timely topic amid the spread of COVID 19, causing a human security crisis worldwide. This symposium today offers us a valuable occasion where we can share our views on common interests and seek ways of cooperation. It is impossible for any single country to confront the threat and address it effectively alone. International cooperation is essential to combat COVID-19, and Japan is determined to work together with others. On the premise of achieving this goal, I should stress the importance for all the countries and organizations to share information and knowledge in a free, transparent, and prompt manner. It should be also taken into consideration that we have to find a balance between resuming social and economic activities and taking appropriate measures to contain COVID-19 at the same time. I think we have not found a perfect answer so far, but at least it is important to share our experiences and our good practices and combine the wisdom obtained from them. Um, now, let me quickly touch upon the latest situation in Japan. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the number of deaths has been a little over a thousand in Japan which is still significantly lower than most other developed countries. The state of emergency was lifted on May 25th, and we're in a process of reopening our social and economic activity step by step. Japan has been taking a science-based approach, encouraging the general public to avoid the situations to create clusters to do such actions as hand washing, wearing masks, using disinfectant to clean surfaces, and ensure proper ventilation when indoors. The situation was a little relaxing in June, but as you may be aware, we are looking at a new alarming situation where the number of infections has been increasing, uh, increasing over the past month. The number of confirmed cases should rapidly rise, and now we are paying close attention to 1,500 confirmed cases for a number of days. However, the situation is quite different from the one in April, as we currently have a much smaller number of patients experiencing severe illness than in April. At the peak in April, there were over 100 severely ill patients in Tokyo and now there are only around 20. Um, since the beginning of June, people in their 20s and 30s have made up 70% of their new cases, which was not the case in April. We are now taking a couple of new approach and countermeasures. First, expanding testing capacities. In addition to the expansion of PCR tests, antigen tests are available. They now have the same approximate accuracy as PCR tests, and the results are available at a short time, and the tests are covered by the health insurance. 
Second is the targeted countermeasure, focusing on specific food or business, which has seen some clusters before. We encourage a wide-scale proactive PCR testing for employees of those specific business, even if they don't have any symptoms. Third, we are strengthening the capabilities of local public health centers, providing these facilities with additional public health nurses to perform appropriate activities within an important step. In addition, AI simulations are proving to be very helpful, providing us with valuable information about how the virus can spread, as well as just how effective countermeasures such as masks are in reducing the risk of infection. We are expecting more to come. To conclude, I highly praise and appreciate the contributors and participants of today's symposium. Through the series of discussion, we will learn from the report and insights of experts in a broad spectrum of sectors. We come to obtain an overall view of what is going on, aspect by aspect, and what could possibly be done. And almost the challenge may be, but it may also be proving the value and worth of certain principles and approaches, like human security, social resilience, and universal health coverage. It may also be presenting opportunities, such as enhancing and updating the health sector. Hopefully, today's occasion can help us all cope with the epidemic and its impact in the world. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your thoughts. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Gad al Adi to give his book. Would you please, Dr. Gad? Okay. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon for everybody. I know the time difference between uh, many of the speakers. It's my pleasure to, to be here today with you giving uh, address uh, speech to this very interesting symposium. At the beginning, I would like to thank uh, Japan site for the promotion of science for uh, allowing us to have this uh, symposium and especially Dr. Wala Saad, the or, or, uh, coordinator of this workshop for, the, for her uh, endless effort to get all the speakers uh, worldwide and these interesting topics. Uh, first of all, uh, you know this uh, a very unprecedented and expect, unexpected COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused a lot of troubles worldwide for the concern of economy, of education, of science and technologies. And there was a lot of challenges how to uh, face such uh, huge and quick, very fast breeding for this uh, pandemic. Uh, started uh, in China and lasted with uh, America and a lot of countries had faced a lot of uh, victims and this toll was rising uh, every day. Uh, for the science and technology community, all of you here, and that was the idea behind this uh, symposium, how to serve our community, how to get uh, a vaccine in a very short time. I know there is a lot of efforts worldwide. Uh, a few days ago, Russia had announced that uh, they got uh, already a vaccine and now is in trial uh, uh, basis for this uh, COVID-19. Uh, so in, in this uh, workshop or symposium, which will be extended for next uh, four or five days, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you a lot of uh, efforts going on uh, worldwide in, the, in, in, in this direction. However, I would like to uh, emphasize and highlight the main issues behind uh, this uh, gathering, the challenges in science and technology uh, we need to address uh, a lot of issues for uh, health and medicine in considering, of course, as, as a science, uh, the strategic uh, development goals for the United Nations. We need to consider online education and the infrastructure for this one in different institutions worldwide. A lot of countries, even and some cities, don't have uh, the internet. I would appreciate if you mute uh, other non-speakers. Uh, 
again, uh, having uh, uh, international community as all of you here today, it will be good to get uh, cross discussion as well as uh, highlight and summary for points for action uh, to be uh, considered for near future in our institutions. I would not like to take lo a lot of time because we are almost behind the schedule. Uh, again, I would like to thank Jess Best for uh, taking uh, this uh, opportunity to consider this uh, workshop. Dr. Wala Saad, Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi, and all speaker uh, will be uh, will 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 give a presentation for next few days. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to conclusion of this uh, symposium. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Raget. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> we are waiting for the National Research Center. Uh, they have some in, uh, in registration and tingling the uh, web. So uh, if they couldn't come for uh, saving our time, I will present the um, talk of NRC uh, till they can join the meeting. It's okay. Uh, now uh, I, I would like to welcome Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi. He 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 is us now, Dr. Ibrahim. Ibrahim, you hear me? It's okay. So so I uh, I uh, I suppose to uh, to, to tell, <coughs> give the talk of NRC now. So just a minute. Uh, until uh, Dr. Wala be ready. So the, the next speaker are ready for your presentation. Okay. Well, would, you, would, you, would you like to try uh, testing, sharing the screen? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Shall you try? Yes. <coughs> Dr. Walla, if you just share the screen with my presentation. Maybe Dr. Okay. Fukami. Okay, Dr. I will share. I will give the uh, NRC uh, uh, talk and will share your presentation now. Okay. I made you uh, the co-host so that you can use your computer. Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. No, no, no. Uh, Professor, Professor. Uh, you can you can share your screen. Yes, yes. You can do that. Yes. So uh, the NRC uh, world. Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim is the president of the NRC. Uh, uh, he wanted to express his apologies because he faced some problem in uh, entering the uh, webinar Zoom now. But Dr. Mamdouh Maud and he he will uh, join us later. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Kimiyama, Embassy of Japan, Director of GSPS, Cairo Office, Professor Fukami, Professor Dr. Gad Al Adi, President of the Raj, Professor Dr. Ibrahim Tantawi, the President of GSPS AAE, and Dr. Wala Saad, Coordinator at Moderator of Symposium. Distinguished delicate lady and gentlemen, give me great pleasure indeed to welcome all of you and be with you today in the opening of ceremony of this important webinar lecture, Symposium 
entitled COVID-19 and Sustainable Development Goal, Sciences and Health Challenge. Sustainable Development Goal were adapted by all United Nations member states in 2015, included our country, Egypt. These goals are universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Since November 2019, the world started facing global health crisis. Unlike any other, it's COVID-19 pandemic health crisis. This crisis is spreading human suffering, destabilizing the global economy, and abandoning the life of billions of people around the globe. COVID-19 crisis requires a whole of government and a whole of society response urgently and sufficiently. This symposium addresses this crisis on the sponsor of GSPS, Cairo Office, Egypt, and in collaboration with National Research Center, as well as GSPS Alumni Association in Egypt. It's our great pleasure to release this important event to discuss scientifically and with multidisciplinary field of sciences, this pandemic crisis, and how to overcome its impact. This symposium address also how we can complementary collaborate all together to successfully reach the aim of goal number three, health of sustainable development goal. We're ensuring health lives and promoting well-being at all age is essential to sustainable development. Thank you with my, with my best wishes a success of this symposium. Thank you. So, now, Dr. Uh, Abraham, I will, I will, if you, if you face any problem to share your screen, I will share screen for you. So, this yes, please. Part. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. So, uh, you will try or I will share your screen? You, 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 you try. You try from your end. Okay. Please, just one. Uh. So if it is my turn, let me first... Uh, uh, hey. Hello. Is it ready? I'm good. Yeah. Just waiting. Should it is okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I want it to be very hot. I put this. Wait. This is mine. Ah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hey, yo. You want to Submit your paper? No? When? At the least uh, after tomorrow. <laughs> Very safe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know the presentation. Yeah, too far. Hmm? Yeah. See you. See you. Yeah. I'm sharing it now, doctor. Yes. Go to the full screen. Thank yeah. you very much. You are welcome. Uh, am I? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, sure. All yes. right. Okay. okay. So let me first congratulate the Dr. Walla for organizing this very interesting as well as successful seminar. So, yeah, I, I shall tell you. When, all right. Okay. okay so okay, the okay. webinar. It's all webinar on COVID-19 and sustainable development goals. Now, this is going to be a very, very time, appropriate time. And I really congratulate the organizers, National Research Center, NRC of Egypt, and Japan Society for Promotion of uh, Science, JSPS, Research Station, Cairo. I really like to uh, thank Professor Dr. Ibrahim Tantawe, the president, Dr. Fukami, the director of JSPS Cairo, Dr. God Il Kwadi, the president of NRI AG, the ambassador of Japan in Egypt, and also uh, Dr. Walla. So I shall now try to start my understanding of the SARS CoV 2 new dimensions. So I am from a university in 
India uh, from Kolkata. My name of my university is Sister Nivedita University. So I shall mainly stress on the infection part. And I, in this infection part, it is becoming very, very important to find out that it will, how it is going to lead us to find out a lot of different types of researchers. Next slide. Now virus as the first disease, say it's doing disease for a long, long period of time. But the discovery of the first human virus was done in 1908 with yellow fever virus, which dominated the world between 1901 to 1928. Discovery of the first coronavirus is the avian infectious bronchitis virus, was in 1937. And still there is a controversy about the discovery of the first human coronavirus, a strain B814 in 1961. The strain is currently lost. Next slide, please. So the first person to isolate a strain of coronavirus called D. 229E was done by Dorothy and Dorothy Hambre, a virologist and infectious disease researcher at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine in 1966. Then in June, in June Almeida, working at the Britain's Common Cold Research Unit in Salisbury, they first produced the first image of the virus in 1967. From that time onwards, there are seven different co human coronavirus species exist today. And you know, the last one is actually the one which is now the reason for the pandemic, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. Now, as this particular COVID-19, you can see that this coronavirus disease, which in 2019 is a pandemic caused by Sir Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2, also called SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that it affects the lung, trachea, broca, and ultimately the alveoli. And if you look at the healthy alveoli, you can see that it is almost empty with, it's very important to find out the different types of exchanges takes place over here. Once it's infected, you can see that the virus starts accumulating in the al alveoli. And then in the moderate infection, you can see this alveoli is partly filled up with the fluid. And when it is a severe case, you can see the whole alveoli is completely filled up with this. Next. So in that particular case, you can see the gas balance, where you can see the red blood cells release carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. And there are two types of alveoli cells, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 cells secrete the surfactant. Next. And when it actually finds out the viral infection, the spike proteins covering the coronavirus bind ACE2 receptors primarily on the type 2 alveoli cells, allowing the virus to inject its RNA. The RNA hijacks the cell, telling it to assemble many more copies of the virus and release them into the alveolus. The host cell is destroyed in this process and the new coronavirus infect neighboring cells. Next. And thereby we could see there is completely impairment of gas exchange. Alveoli collapse due to loss of surfactant type two cells. Less oxygen enters the bloodstream and more fluid enters the alveolus. So in that way, the infection proceeds and go to the severe symptoms. Next slide actually is going to demonstrate that the immune response on the part of host. So right after infection, the type two cells, they release the inflammatory signals that recruit the macrophages, which is called known as the immune cells. The macrophage release cytokines that cause vasodilation which allows more immune cells to come to the site of injury and exit the capillary. The fluid accumulates and dilutes the surfactant. The neutrophils are recruited to the site of infection and a lot of reactive oxygen species are released to destroy the infected cells. Now type one and two cells are destroyed leading to the collapse of the alveoli 
and causing this acute respiratory distress syndrome. But if the inflammation becomes severe, the protein-rich fluid can enter the bloodstream and travel elsewhere in the body, causing systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, SIRS. And the SIRS may lead to septic shock and multi-organ failure, which can have fatal but at, to reach that particular stage, it is very difficult. And that's why we could see the mortality is very, very less. But if we can actually arrest the virus infection before, this will not go up to the death stage. Next slide. But it's very interesting to find out that COVID-19, it discriminates age, gender, immune system fitness, the pre-existing diseases, and the epigenetic factors. So I shall discuss now a little bit about these things. Next slide. Next slide. So in an invader's impact, it was found that in the organs which are affected are actually, you can see, it causes the acute cardiac injury, causing the CVD, hypertension, it causes acute kidney injury, causing chronic kidney disease. Creatinine level goes up, burn, urine output. Acute liver injury, there is ALT and AST differences. The diabetes, and there are other organ injuries like brain, testis, eye, etc. Now this blue line indicates the association between the pre-existing chronic disease and COVID-19 severity. And the red line, they indicate the organ injuries. And the other expression of ACE2 in the indicated organs is indicated by the ACE2, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Next slide. Now, the COVID 19 fatality risk, there is an epigenetic dysregulation of the immune system and of the renin angiotensin system, RAS which may be increased fatality risk. A variety of biological clocks have been shown to predict human health and longevity more acutely than <laughs> chronical, chronological age. And better than their chronological age is thought to be undergoing accelerated things. And that cause increases the risk of COVID-19 fatality. So I can tell you, the individuals who live healthy lifestyles and consume geroprotectors such as metformin, resveterol, and NAD boosters may have decreased risk of fatality. And in this youth epigenetic regulation, we find that it controls immune response. And in case of the dysregulation, you can have the immune senescence, the inflammatory and biological age is much greater than the chronic age. And thereby, I could find the environmental factors and comorbidities actually did a lot of its importance. So that is what we call as a cytokine storm. Next slide. Now this epigenetic mechanism in SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. This is a uh, cartoon which says, the expression of the ACE2 gene and the interferon gene depends on the methylation rate of the CPG islands in the DNA promoter sequence. Susceptible individuals, mostly men, the elderly, the smokers, show a hypomethylation pattern. Whereas women, children, and non-smokers show DNA hypermethylation and lower and interferon proteins. The high presence of ACE2 on epithelial cells and interferon makes people more susceptible to the infection and there is increased disease severity. Whereas a low presence of ACE2 and interferon seems to offer disease protection. Unfortunately, recently certain strains are coming out by the mutation whereby we could see that even the children are getting affected with COVID-19. Next. Next slide. 
So why does COVID-19 disproportionately affect older people? You know that in the aged system, which uh, they are actually reaction is initially slow, resulting in greater viral replication, defective macrobiome. So anyway, if T, your immune response is less, it causes greater viral replication. The defective macrophages, T cells with a limited repertoire of receptors are less effective. And the endothelial cell lining of the capillary becomes inflamed. Fibroblasts are activated. Surge COVID-2 viral components and cytokines enter the bloodstream. If it enters the bloodstream, fluid fills the alveoli, reducing lung capacity, virus infects microvials, a cytokine storm initiates microvascular clotting causing severe hypoxia, coagulopathy, and organ failure. And this is how we can find out that there is a disproportionately it affect the older people, that is people above 60. Next. Now, uh, I, I shall not go farther on this. Uh, there are many other reports that are coming that the IgG galactosylation and many other immune systems in the uh, age-related changes, which are also uh, maybe the cause for increased COVID-19 susceptibility. Next slide. Next slide. So the chronology of events, if we look at, we can see that after the SARS-CoV-2 infects the cells, expressing the surface receptors angiotensin-converting enzyme, and another, what is called a TMPRSS2, the active replication and release of virus causes the host cell to undergo pyroptosis and release the damage associated molecular patterns, including ATP, nucleic acid, and ASC oligomers. Now, these are recognized by the neighboring epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and alveolar macrophages, triggering the generation of pro inflammatory cytokines and chemokines like IL-6, IP10, macrophage inflammatory protein, 1-alpha, beta, MCP1. These proteins attract the monocytes, macrophages and T cells to the site of infection, promoting further inflammation with the addition of interferon gamma produced by T cells and establishing a pro-inflammatory feedback loop. Next slide. And then in the defective immune, immune response, this may lead to further accumulation of immune cells in the lungs, causing overproduction of this pro-inflammatory cytokines and which eventually damages the lung infrastructure. The resulting cytokine storm circulates to other organs leading to multi-organ damage and thereby causing the death. Now in a healthy immune response, the infected cells rapidly cleared Virus inactivated by neutralizing antibodies, minimal inflammation and lung damage takes place. And that results in recovery. Next. Next slide. Now, if we, if we consider the pathological inflammation in patients with COVID-19, you can see that as I mentioned to you, the alveolar epithelial cells, the CCL to CCL7, they are going to the activated endothelium or delayed type 1 interferon response, they go to the interferon receptors, or GMCSF, this actually also activates the JAK-STAT pathway. So we call this is as an activated C T cell, as well as the role of the cells, natural killer cells. And this JAK-STAT pathway is actually going to ultimately um, causing the oxidative stress and NF-kappa-B inflammatory genes with all different types of protein kinases and monocyte-derived inflammatory macrophage. And thereby, the cytokine storm where overproduction of IL-6, TNF, IL-8, IL-10, 6, IL-10, IL-1-RA are causing the cytokine storm and ultimately the patient's death. Next. Now the question comes that we don't have medicine against it. We don't have vaccine against it. So we have to think about the max, which is absolutely important 
to reduce the risk of this type of transmission. Because if you know the particle size, 110, 1.1, if, if you had infected asymptomatic, infected asymptomatic, that means you are infected, you have the viral replicating, but your immune system is such that it can come back with it. Then the viruses which are coming out, and if you have healthy one, if you have mass, it will not go. But if you don't have the max, there will be an exposure. Now, this particular thing is going to help. But if you have all of the people, even the symptomatic, they also have the max, then what will everybody is going to have the minimum exposure. So the whole population right now, whether you have symptom or not, healthy or not, you have to have masks on it to reduce the risk of this transmission of the virus. Next. Next. Next slide. And you know that COVID-2 wreck havoc within the host. Rapidly emerging data are leading to advanced understanding. And in this six months of time in 2020, uh, in the month of July, there are almost 14,573 journal articles on SARS-CoV-2 with 30 retractions and three temporary re retractions. So you can see that science and technology is advancing in such a space. And I thank JSPS because JSPS is also supporting large number of this type of research collaborations on SARS-CoV-2. We should regarding this COVID-2 infection. Next slide. Next slide. So this is one particular paper I find is very important and in the recently the cell published it. It is a global proteomics of phosphorylation and abundance changes of SARS-CoV-2. It was found and this was done by the next slide. It shows that this particular number of significantly regulated phosphorylation side groups at the infection time course is, you can see that change. And there is number of significantly regulated proteins across the infection time course also after zero hour, two hour, four hour, eight hour, 12 hours, 24 hours. And there are a large number from platelet degranulation, collagen containing extracellular matrix, platelet dense granule domain, hyaluronan, RNA polymerase to a hollow enzyme, all these things are actually changing in a way or not, either down-regulated or up-regulated. Next slide. And thereby, we, they could map the different phosphorylation site and identify the localization of this site because this may actually help in developing antiviral molecules. Next slide. Next slide. And when they looked at it, they found that one of the very interesting protein casein kinase 2 is absolutely found to the end protein is also been mapped with the crystal structure. And it is also possible to find out how this phosphorylation changes. Next slide. Next slide. And there are 332 human proteins which gets older. And there are a lot of clusters of significantly changing phosphorylation sites across the time course of infection with non-redundant enriched reactome pathway terms shown for each cluster. And thereby, we can say that the signaling changes in host cell SARS-CoV-2 infection is really becoming very, very important. Next slide. Next slide. And that changes, you can see that overall phosphorylation change of a protein complex, how actually you can see the Pearson correlation, where you can see minus one to one, from deep blue to deep red, you can see the distribution of the different protein molecules over here in the uh, side, which has got the complex phosphorylation. And the complex phosphorylation pattern is actually helping us to identify very, very important antiviral things. Next. Next.
Next slide. And it's very interesting to find out that the casein kinase 2, if you remember, I'm mentioning to you, the casein kinase 2 and the viral proteins at actin protrusions are co localized. And that could be done by very nice experiments in the CACO2 cells. And hereby, it is possible to demonstrate that actin and this casein kinase 2, which gets phosphorylated, are actually getting associated with each other. And this co-localization throughout the infected cells uh, infection process is a very interesting fi finding. Next slide. Next slide. It is also interesting to find out that SARS-CoV-2 causes cell cycle arrest. And if you look at the cell cycle arrest, it was found that it full change profiles of indicated cell cycle and DNA damage substance during the infection. And it is very interesting to find out DNA content analysis of cells infected with SARS-CoV-2 for 24 hours compared to the mock infected cells. You can see in the cell cycle, Z0, G1 is being depressed. The S phase is going to activate it. The G2M phase is also activated almost more than 100% in S and G2M. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So this mapping was done and the mapping regulated kinase to kinase inhibitors was done. So now we know that these are the kinase which can do. So then there are a lot of kinase inhibitors that are available. So why don't we try the kinase inhibitors? You know, the one of the most important drug right now we are using the remdesivir. And if we plot the remdesivir, versus the uh, viral load, you can see the very uh, sharply down more than one micromolar. So one micromolar, more than one micromolar, but the cell viability is not affected, but the viral load is going to be affected is one of the reasons why people are trying with this remdesivir. Other than that, the cancer be also been used, but it was found it is also have a lot of effect on the cell viability. So it is not a very good one. Next slide. Next slide. So in that way, it was found the Apili mode, Dinazi Silibi, all these actually being utilized right now to find out the active final this anti it's very interesting to find out that cell viability is not affected but apple mode even 0.01 micromolar is very effective in case of the um, dinosaur it is greater than 0.1 but so apple mode is another drug right now people are thinking about how to utilize this next next and this is a very interesting paper which is right now in the pre-proof thing so it's not yet published that there is an increase in plasma cells in both covid 19 and the 47 iav avian influenza a virus patients XAF1, TNF, and fast induced T cell apoptosis was found in COVID 19. STAT1 and IRF3 signaling pathways activated in COVID 19 versus a STAT3 and NF kappa B in IAV patients. So they studied the comparison between the two, and there are a lot of interesting observations that are coming out and been going to be published in a very important journal called Immunity. Next slide. Next slide. Now, the, uh, 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 there are certain breakthroughs regarding the vaccine. And you know that number of, as mentioned already, that Russians are claiming they are already being testing a vaccine, which is actually may come out. Uh, but besides that, we know this Oxford vaccine trial and the vaccine trial in the US and China, they are many of them actually reached the phase three. And here the New England Journal, which actually announced about the mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And then recently in the Lancet paper, 
in the last uh, week, uh, you have a lot of other important things which are coming up. So next slide. Next slide. And it's what's a risk you can find out that there is a greatest concern for the world at the economic at the societal at the geopolitical the technological on the environmental and everywhere it is affecting so we have to get how actually to combat this particular demon and that is why research and parallelly our knowledge is becoming very very important next uh, the one previous to this so Previous to this, previous slide, please. Previous slide, please. Yeah. But over here, I want to, it's a global phenomena, the COVID stigma, the racial stigma, blaming community for the current situation, the violence against the health workers. All of these things we have to fight. We have to fight being kind to the affected individuals we have to depend on facts and not rumors we have to spread the awareness regarding the do's and don'ts as endorsed by our health workers and also very important is providing mental health care and thereby i shall go to my last slide where i just like to say next slide every problem makes us creative every challenge offers opportunity let us be resourceful and cater to the demands of humanity. Stay safe, stay home, stop coronavirus, stay positive. I shall give first huge thanks to the healthcare workers on the front line in this coronavirus pandemic. I shall give thanks to JSPS and the organizers and specifically Dr. Walla and the faculty members as well as all the people who are attending all these 26 people who are participating in this seminar so far so thank you very much thank you thank you so much uh, dear uh, chancellor it's a very interesting uh, lecture and very interesting slides thank you so much so uh, any of the um, attendants have any questions you can uh, have 10 minutes to, to questions and answer so please, um, anyone have question? Let me raise your hand, and uh, I will accept the questions. Okay. Yes. No questions. It's okay. Thank I I have I have a question. <laughs> uh, you talk about um, the viral load and the amount of viral um, uh, amount of virus into the body. So, so, so that is um, um, many, 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 uh, many uh, healthy health provider doctors or uh, nurses or many, uh, a lot of many uh, doctors infected with um, virus get more um, severe symptoms and more uh, deteriorated of health. Um, uh, more exposure. Yes. Because uh, the virus load, amount of virus enter uh, is a body. So, uh, so uh, is this state uh, still uh, uh, current with um, mild symptoms and signs for uh, uh, virus or is still as uh, severe as uh, first uh, presented uh, on March um, 2020? Yeah. Is so, as I, men as, as I mentioned to you, this is actually determined by the R0 factor. And in this particular case, COVID-19 was found to be more infectious, so less number of virus is sufficient to infect a person but the person's reaction to that is also very interesting depends on his immune system depends on his epigenetic clusters and all the other different factors i mentioned to you that without any comorbidity or anything else now so the viral load is something which is actually is less in the asymptomatic patients and then in the first stage of infection then the viral starts replicating in the system and as the replication goes on the viral load builds up and sometimes a person in actually sheds 10,000 per sneezing and that particular load is very high 
and the possibility of the persons infected in his surroundings or her surroundings were very, very high. The healthcare workers which they are facing right now, even having this, all the different types of precautions, are sometimes getting exposed to this excessive number of viral particles which are there in this. And that's why we have to take major protection and we have to, one of the major thing we have to think about that you have to be careful that always we should have masks because I am asymptomatic doesn't mean that I'm not shading virus. I'm also shading virus. Maybe I have infected, but my system is enough protected. It is not going uh, higher. That's why I don't have any symptom. Yes, you are right. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to share uh, other questions. Yeah, I could find that there is a why the this human coronavirus they cannot infect the birds, so yeah. the birds have not been infected by human coronavirus. We Any have, other question? Oh yes, uh, we have a question from Dr. Hayam Nazif uh, uh, from Egypt. Uh, uh, yeah. he, he, may you introduce yourself, Dr. Hayam? Uh, Dr. Hayam Nazif, Professor of Pediatrics, Faculty of Postgraduate Childhood Studies, Saint Shams uh, University in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chato Padjai, for your very informative uh, uh, lecture. Uh, very, very interesting and uh, really uh, great knowledge. Uh, I would like to ask you about your opinion about the term super spreaders. Who are the super spreaders and is this term correct? Uh, we'd like to hear your opinion about that. Yeah, the super spreaders are those. Say for example, I have a very strong immune system. So in, within my system, I can come back with the virus, okay? But while I'm talking, while I'm sneezing, while I'm coughing, the virus is coming out through me. I am healthy, so I don't care to have the mask. So then, what will happen? I'm always shading the number of viruses. Now, if this particular people who are actually in my neighborhood, they have a less immune system or they have a weaker immune system or their age is higher or, <laughs> or they have some other comorbidity symptoms, then what will happen? Even the small number of viruses can cause a huge amount of infection. And once it goes inside the system, it will start replicating in such a fast rate that immediately that person will get. So these are the person asymptomatic, but infected are going to be the super spreader. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hayam. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I wanted to share a slide I didn't share uh, before your, um, before your, your talk. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Um, this biography for uh, for, so, sorry. Uh, 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 Hashim Hisham Sebi also has a question. question. Uh, 